Opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. It's Monday. I know we're all just sort of getting it together for the start of the week here, but we're going to be with you live for the next two hours talking about how you and I can be more effective, more efficient, working with a child on the autism spectrum to reach their fullest potential. Or if you are somebody who is watching us, who is a teen or an adult on the autism spectrum, tools and things that you can help yourself to be more efficient, more effective in your life. And by the way, all the things that we talk about hopefully will help all of us to be more effective, more efficient as we move through our lives. Because a lot of what we talk about here, we, we problem solve, right? <laughs> That's what we hope to do anyway. And a lot of what we talk about is ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis. And this is uh, an age old science of applying what we know about behavior to different circumstances to increase behaviors that we want to see more of and decrease behaviors we want to see less of. ABA was not invented for autism, but fortunately, thankfully, gratefully, it is as effective uh, when dealing with someone on the autism spectrum as dealing with someone who's not on the autism spectrum. So we do talk about that. It is a scientifically proven uh, technique of seeing progress and teaching new skills to children on the autism spectrum and decreasing challenging behavior and other behaviors that we want to see less of on the autism spectrum. So it's a great thing to talk about and there are a lot of, it's not a cookie cutter. So there are a lot of different tools that we talk about and figuring out how we apply them in different circumstances. It's a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way of looking at ourselves and a whole new way of looking at our children that frankly I have found as an autism parent, because that's what I am, I have found it to be amazing. Um, I, I will be 100% honest with you that I am not always good at the things that we t learn and talk about here on the show. I try to walk my talk, but let me just tell you, I don't always. And I'm incredibly honest about that because I'm still learning. Um, but that's why I'm here is because I'm deeply curious and because I am an autism parent. And what I want more than anything else in the world is to show up for my, I want to say little boy. He's not a little boy anymore. My son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. He's nine now. And figuring out the ways in which to help him reach his fullest potential is something that fills my days. It fills my days, fills my nights sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we stay up late and think about how can I help my child? And I will tell you something that uh, I did. I laid awake a lot, uh, for a, a lot of days and nights uh, trying to figure out what will my husband and I going to do to help our child. We started ABA therapy right after his third birthday. And it wasn't very long at all before I saw, oh my goodness, this is working and we're getting our child back. And that was fabulous. You know, we had to fight and do a lot of things to be able to get access to the ABA. But once I saw it, I said, this is amazing. Why doesn't everybody have access to this? And then I stayed awake a lot, uh, a lot of days and nights thinking, how are we going to see uh, the world change so that more people and not just more people, so that everyone has access to this information. Uh, so please know that's where I'm coming from. I am not an expert in ABA. Uh, I am the conduit to help you to get access to as much as possible information, services, resources, help and support, whatever it is that you need, but you need to tell me so that I can hunt it down for you. Really, I'm trying to uh, be of service to you and what you're trying to do, because I think you're remarkable. Um, 
and I think that your child is worth it. Uh, <laughs> that all the energy that you're expending and all the things that you would like to see your child have, I think your child, I know your child's worth it. And I want to help you to make all of those things happen if I can in any way that I can. So how can you converse with me? How can you converse with our experts? Let's go through some of the different ways. If you're watching us on autism-live.com, then you see there's a box there where I'm talking and next to it is an empty box. Above it, it says, Shannon is answering right now. Uh, that box is active if it says that. It means you can type anything you want in there, hit enter, and it shows up magically here on my screen. Now, here's something important. Uh, sometimes, if, if it's appropriate, I will share it so that everybody can see your question. If you put personal information, I have a way of not showing it. Uh, so just so that you know that. If you want to, because I have no way of knowing who you are, getting in touch with you, if you want me to contact you after the show. But if you put personal information, then I have a way of not showing that so uh, but again you don't have to log in to this you just type you don't have to tell us who you are I don't I don't necessarily need to know who you are um, but if you do just I, I just want to let you know that I can not share that um, so and in that way you and I can be having a conversation and I can if I've got an expert in here I can tell them what it is that you're asking and we can have the conversation and I know a lot of you have been writing in in that way and we love it when you participate that way uh, this is exactly what it's meant for to be there to support you now if you're watching autism-live.com and it says rebroadcast then that box won't be active but there are still lots of ways to get in touch with us and by the way all these ways work no matter how you're watching us so let's talk about some of those different ways uh, you can see on your screen there is our email address and we love to get emails from you what we'll do is answer your question on the next available live show but we also send you a typewritten response whether it's from us or from an expert uh, that we've passed your message on to and said, you know, here's somebody who wants to know about this. What do you have to say on that? We get back to you in writing. So that's a lovely thing. You can also phone us. We have a phone line that you can be patched in directly into the show so that you can talk to experts in real time if that's what works for you or you and I can be having a conversation about something you know sometimes you just have to be heard and don't I know that uh, so feel free to to call into the show if you call outside of the show hours uh, you can either speak to someone or if it's uh, nighttime here for us when nobody's in the office you can leave us a message and we'll get back to you as soon as we're back in the office hey by the way you can also Skype with us if that's an easier thing for you I know a lot of you watch internationally we're in 103 countries and uh, if you want an easier less expensive way to get a hold of us you can Skype into the show we're going to be Skyping in just a little while in just a few minutes with a mom blogger who's written a really incredible blog so feel free and we've Skyped internationally with great success so we, you know there's a time change thing uh, but we you know can work around that so please feel free to Skype with us uh, there is our Skype name and uh, you can also be in touch with us via our Facebook page. We're on Facebook and we have a relatively new page. We appreciate your likes while you're there. Check out some of the information that we have posted there and uh, share it with other people if you feel that that's appropriate for you. And also participate in the question of the day on Facebook. I love when you guys interact with us, but I think even more than that, I love it when you interact with each other and lift each other up and say, hey, I've felt that way too, or thank you for writing that, or I've, you know, I, I know, you know, this resource, share information with each other. If, if we don't hold hands on this journey and help each other, whew, we're wasting a lot of time, right? A lot of time and a lot of energy. Okay, and you can also participate with us on Twitter. I make the promise to you guys, if you follow us, we'll follow you. I know I had to catch up on that a little bit over the weekend, but I did. Uh, so if you are following us and we are not following you, email me right now because according to my records, I have followed everyone who followed us. So please uh, let's interact because we want to know what's going on with you as well. Uh, and you can answer the question of the day on Twitter or send us topic suggestions, questions, whatever you would like on Twitter. I mentioned that there are other ways to watch our show because you can watch us on autism-live.com. 
but there are lots of other ways you can watch this as well uh, especially if there's a specific topic that you want to see or you want to pause rewind fast forward uh, one of the sites that you can be watching us on is blip.tv this is a great site I always say it's like having a personal DVR for our show if you want to look up a topic or you saw an interview with somebody and you think oh my gosh I really like the way they speak about this because you know how sometimes you get it from one person and not from another you can search other times that they've been on the show uh, we usually have people on uh, as often as we can get them <laughs> Let's say that. Uh, so you can pause, rewind, fast forward. Uh, you can also uh, be checking us out on YouTube. We have our very own YouTube channel. And the thing I like about that, you can pause, rewind, fast forward there too. Leave comments, leave questions there, and share. Share our YouTube videos. I know you guys have been doing that more and more, and we really appreciate that because it makes the information available to more people. This information is free, and so feel free to spread it around. Share it when you think of appropriate. You can also download us for free on iTunes. Uh, all these ways are free, in fact. Uh, and we appreciate when you give us reviews on iTunes. And you can also find us on Ustream and more ways coming. We'll have announcements about that coming up very, very soon. All right. We like to start every morning with something that I fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. Jargon of the day is when we take one word, one phrase, one anagram, and we try to demystify it. Give you an actual definition, and then give you a working definition that hopefully you can see how it applies to your individual child. Our whole purpose here is to make friends with the jargon so we're not lost in the conversation. This is a whole new word world for us. Most of us did not go to college for psychology, and I know very few people that before their child was diagnosed with autism ever took a class or had any information. So all of a sudden you're, you've got all these behaviors that you're dealing with, all this research that you're dealing with, and then all this jargon you got to wade through. So we're trying to shrink it down so that it's not overwhelming one little bit at a time to build our understanding of things. Okay. So our word today, this is a perfect example. It's sometimes the jargon, somebody says something and it's a word that you're totally familiar with. You understand what it means in the, the normal context of the working world, but within autism, it means something slightly different. Okay, so our word today is target. I mean, we certainly have heard this word before, right? Uh, it's, a it's a store. I started to say grocery store. In some cases, it is. It's a store, right? And we've seen, you know, the bullseye everywhere. We know what a target is, right? What's it got to do with autism? Okay, here is our uh, actual definition, the behavior currently on acquisition. All right, little highbrow definition here, but uh, our working definition is what you want the child to learn. Now this might seem like a, well, a duh, okay, all right, so it's the target. <laughs> Excuse me, but a lot of times, um, I, I'm going to speak from personal experience and this may not be you. It might just be me. <laughs> and sometimes it is, sometimes it is, but sometimes it's, uh, we go, Oh yeah, no, I've been, I've done that before. I've been guilty of that as if there's something to be guilty of, but you're teaching one thing to a child and you've said, this is the target. This is what I want the child to learn. Uh, and yet something happens while you're teaching that something else happens and we pause for a second to address that other thing, right? Not necessarily a horrible thing, that's nothing, nothing to be guilty of, but sometimes, especially when we're dealing with autism, we wanna let other things go because we're focusing on the target, on the behavior that we're trying to teach, the skill that we're trying to teach, and in that instance, we're trying to create a bubble where we teach that behavior. Later on, we're gonna intersperse it amongst different things, but it's really important to be focused. Perfect example. Uh, we talk about compliance all the time and how important it is to teach compliance, to have a child do something um, and listen to us and want to listen to us. But sometimes when we're teaching compliance, uh, instead of rewarding compliance, 
we about manners and about other things, right? Um, you know, the perfect example that I talk about, and we'll, you know, a, a, a dog obedience class where, uh, and this was years ago before I was ever, you know, thinking about having a child, had a dog, was at a dog obedience class, and the teacher was saying, okay, we're teaching the, the, the dogs to come here. So say, come here to the dog. And it's gonna take a while, but we're gonna teach the dogs to come here. And the guy who was standing next to me with his dog said, come here to the dog, and the dog didn't come. And, uh, and you know, it's, there's a teaching process that's there. And eventually he was yelling at the dog and saying, come here. And the dog finally came because he yelled. And the guy um, was getting ready to swat his dog. And the dog trainer said, whoa, 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 be careful what you do right now because the dog came and we're trying to teach the dog to come. That's the target. We're not working on other things. And if you swat the dog, if you punish the dog for having come, having achieved the target, then the dog's not going to want to do that again, right? And in that moment, I mean, you know, I was never going to be friends with a guy standing next to me, let's be honest about that. Uh, he was impatient and, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not about hitting dogs or children, uh, uh, you know, whatever. But uh, in any case, uh, he wasn't going to get the behavior that he wanted. He wasn't keeping, being mindful about what the target was. And we have all done things like that. I certainly, I could probably tell you something that I did on Saturday with my individual child where I'm trying to teach one thing and I get sidetracked by something else. So I think target is a great word because we have to have that mindset whenever possible, remind ourselves, what am I teaching here? What am I teaching here? And so that's the thing that we focus on and we don't get distracted by other things. Uh, a perfect example of my individual child uh, was a couple of years ago. He, uh, he has a social lunch group um, situation, a lunch bunch thing. And uh, for a couple of weeks, it was being run by the uh, student teachers. And it's important to have student teachers and it's important to be mindful of that, you know, there's another generation of people that need to learn about our kids and what to do and so on and so forth. So my child was in this class to learn social language. And he said something in the class that was inappropriate. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think what it was. Because uh, it was something that was just, it was jargon. It was like something kids would say. And he said it to one of those student teachers. And she uh, got upset with him and punished him for it. And I said, you can't do that. You cannot punish him for that. He's in a social language class. He used social, social language. He used it inappropriately. But talk to him about it. But he doesn't get punished for that. He just, you know, doesn't get punished for that. And it was a little bit difficult explaining to the student teacher because she wasn't quite getting it. And I said, you're trying to teach him to use social language appropriately. So teach him. Don't punish him when he does it. Correct him but don't punish him. <laughs> um, and that was really hard for her to understand. And I think the whole thing was that she was like, well, he needs to be polite. And I said, yes. And when we're in a politeness class, we'll do that. But he was using social language. And what he did was spoke in a way that he would have spoken to one of his friends. Oh, I know what it was. Uh, he, he asked the teacher, what were they gonna do? He was used to doing things a certain way in the class. And he asked her what they were gonna do and she told him and he said, well, I don't really wanna do that. I really wanna play games. Why can't we play games? And she said, because I'm the teacher and I said, we're not gonna play games. And he said, well, that's weak. Inappropriate. I don't want him talking to a teacher that way. But he was in a social language class with his friends where they're trying to teach him social language with other boys his age and saying, well, that's weak is exactly the target we were trying to hit. Exactly the target. Now, did he use it in the right way? No, he said it to a teacher. So that needs an adjustment, but that's not a punishment because he hit the target. You see what I'm saying? Important to remember what you're teaching and why. What is, what is the target? And make sure you're reinforcing when they get the target and not punishing it ever. <laughs> 
okay. Because uh, punishment really doesn't work to begin with. All right, I digress. Uh, we always have a question of the day for you. And the question today is, how does your child request for things they want or need? Um, you know, we talk about manding a lot. Manding is when a child requests or demands for something. And we want to know, how does your child do that? It may be that your child grunts your child might point, your child might tantrum, your child may sign, your child may use a device, your child may do a picture exchange um, system, but there, there is some way in which that your child is requesting things or we need to work towards your child finding some way to request things. But what we see with children who are tantruming a lot, it's because they don't have functional communication skills to make their needs known. Um, so probably there might be some way that, not always, I mean, there are some kids who just simply don't request um, and aren't tantruming for things. And in that case, we really need to get to work to make it rewarding for them to request in an appropriate way. But we're always, for all of our kids, looking for appropriate ways for them to request and we want them to request hundreds of times a day, probably thousands of times a day. That's what helps us to build language skills. And I'm not just talking about vocal skills, all kinds of language skills. Our ultimate goal with all kids is to reach the fullest potential. We know that's going to be different for all kids. For some kids, that's going to be vocal. For some children, it isn't going to be. But for those children, as much as for the other children, we want functional communication skills so that they can be heard in a way that is clear, right? Isn't that what we all want? Um, you know, and, and we want that in a lot of different ways. I, I can remember saying, I, I want my child to talk and I want my child to be able to have conversation. And you know, that's really one of the things that we focused on and I have that and I'm so lucky that I have that. Uh, do we still have other things that we need to work on within? Oh, you betcha. And one of the things that I left out of on my want list, fortunately I had other people who were saying, oh, by the way, you also want this. I wanted my child to be able to do and understand, to express and understand with gestures and with his face. Um, and I'll be honest with you, he does that with his face and with his voice, but his gestures, it is not his first go-to. He still has to be prompted a little bit to gesture. It's still an area that is not caught up in terms of gesture. Um, and we want our kids to be as well-rounded as we can. So for each child, something different, but how does your child request for things that they want or need? My child expresses how, himself very vocally now, uh, sometimes with gesture and sometimes with whining. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest uh, that that's some of uh, the phase that we have been going through. A little bit of whining that we're trying to target right now um, by making sure that we don't pay attention to that. That we do not, uh, he does not get uh, a paycheck for whining. Uh, and there you have it. But the problem, can I tell you the problem why we have not had the ultimate success is that mommy likes to nag about it and go, that's whining right now. I hate it when you're whining. I wish you wouldn't whine. If mom would stop saying that, I think we would have infinite more success. It's me. Uh, so just now, I don't have this perfectly. Can I just say how not perfectly? I have this, but we all do the best we can on a given day. But I, I just feel the need to remind you on this Monday that none of you should be sitting there thinking, oh, I, you know, that we get out the, the big wet noodle and start giving ourselves lashes. You're doing the best that you can. We're just trying to learn and grow. Do a little bit better today or not. Uh, do a little bit better tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, we always have a topic of the week and you might be able to guess that uh, our topic this week is teaching language. And when I say language, I'm not just talking about vocally, although we don't want to leave that out because if that's a possibility for our child, we want to leave no stone unturned for that, right? Um, but but there are lots of other things on that journey as well to teach our children language. It is such an exhaustive area. Um, but 
fascinating and rewarding because when you get that response back, you know, this morning I find myself thinking of Carly Fleischman. We had her dad, the author of uh, Carly's Voice, on the show with us a couple of months ago now. And if you haven't read his book, you should. And Carly writes uh, a chapter in the book. But here was a child who was nonverbal. There was no communication happening. There was no requesting. And she was nine. And there, there were a lot of years where they were hopeful of, you know, maybe we can get to something. And it wasn't happening. And at nine, she reached over and typed onto somebody's typewriter and said, teeth hurt, help. And now this young woman who is a teenager, uh, is a very prolific writer, has a blog, ha as on Facebook, uh, you know, we don't give up. We don't give up. We can't give up. We're never giving up on anybody. And nobody's giving up on you, and you're certainly not giving up on your child, and we're certainly not giving up uh, in any way right? Uh, so we talk about teaching language in all the different ways that there are for people to communicate, because uh, communication is key. For, for Carly's dad to be able to have conversations now and understand Carly, uh, amazing, life-changing, brilliant. Um, is it easy? No, it's not, it's not easy. But I would say, what is easy? We're autism parents. We Easy somewhere else. Not even part of the vocabulary, right? Not even worth discussing. But it's rewarding that he can have a conversation with his daughter now and that she can let him know what she's thinking and feeling. So we don't give up ever. Uh, all right, some of the things that we're going to be talking about today, we have the stress tip um, that we'll be talking about in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but before that, we're going to go to break and then we're going to be joined by Kim, I hope I'm saying it right, Grosso. Uh, and she is a, a mom blogger. Her blog is autisminreallife.com and she wrote a blog that you may have seen over the last couple of days, Five Reasons Why Autism Moms Rock. You got to love that, right? We have to start on a Monday morning with that because it's too much fun. And we've got a funding tip and we've got a whole bunch of other stuff uh, throughout the rest of the time that we're here today. But of course, we always defer all of that to take your questions. So now's a great time to be writing in questions. But uh, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we are going to be joined by Kim Grosso. So stick with us. is a revolutionary web-based program that incorporates comprehensive assessment, curriculum design, progress tracking, and treatment evaluation for children with autism all in one place. Developed by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, our approach is based on over 40 years of research on the principles of learning and their application to improving the lives of children with autism. How does skills work? Created with speed and simplicity in mind, Skills was modeled on an easy three-step process. Step 1. Start Assessment Step 1 begins with our Intelligent Assessment System, which consists of a series of questions. This assessment is essential to identifying your child's level of skills compared to their typical peers across all areas of development. This includes assessing social, motor, language, adaptive, play, cognition, executive functions, and academic skills. Every skill has an assigned age which indicates when the skill emerges during typical development. This means that each child is automatically presented only with lessons that are relevant to his or her age. Step 2. Choosing Activities It's now easier than ever to build an individualized treatment plan. In Step 2, 
you are presented with an individualized pool of activities that are directly linked to your student's assessment results. Each activity represents a specific skill that has been indicated by the assessment as needing to be taught. Activities are categorized by curriculum and then by lesson. There are three main types of skills, building blocks, fundamental, and expansion skills. Fundamental skills are necessary for successful everyday functioning. Building blocks are prerequisites to a fundamental skill. Expansion skills are non-essential skills, but may provide further enrichment in certain areas. After reviewing the activities available to you, you can quickly add your chosen activities to the treatment plan by simply checking the box and clicking the button. Step 3. Start Treatment Once you have selected and added the activities you want, you are ready to begin teaching. Skills provide you with all the tools necessary to design and manage an effective curriculum plan, such as printable activity guides that are customizable by the teacher, supplemental teaching aids including printable data sheets, teaching guides, visual aids, worksheets and tracking forms, detailed IEP goals and benchmarks for each activity, brief and visually appealing video tutorials, a variety of treatment progress and clinical timeline charts, and lots more. And since Skills is completely web-based, everything you need is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in one easy-to-access location. Skills users even benefit from unlimited access to a support community, where they can ask questions and share ideas with a Skills expert. Skills is always with you. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're still trying to connect with mom blogger Kim Grosso. And as we do that, we're gonna go ahead and talk about the stress tip of the week. And today's tip is about letting go. And you might ask yourself, oh my goodness, what am I letting go of, <laughs> right? There's a whole host of things that we can all attempt to let go of on a daily basis. And we're not gonna talk about all of them, right? Um, but let's let's go over a couple of individual things that we can do. Uh, how about letting go of the need to pretend that everything is okay, that you know that we have more money than we have, that our child uh, is behaving in a way that they're not. Whatever it is that we're pretending, uh, we can let go of that and release that. I will tell you that as I was writing some of these things and talking to other people about this over the weekend, um, you know, for me, this is sort of a list of the things I feel guilty about this because this is kind of the things that I didn't do when I needed them to do them. You know, I can I could just hear my mother at, at times saying to me uh, when I was growing up, you know, don't do what I did, do something better than what I did. Uh, and this is sort of so if you feel like you can't, please know I'm not judging because I didn't I didn't do these things when I should have. But letting go of the need to pretend that I think there was so much time while we were going through the really worst aspects of autism that I was trying so hard to make it look like I was okay, that my son was okay, that we were all okay, and that we weren't struggling. That we are going to do this and it's going to be fine. I'm a big one for, you know, I say if you, that thing from Life's Little Instruction Booklet, if you're going after Moby Dick, well then pack the tartar sauce and be positive. And I do, I do think that that's important, but don't pretend that everything is okay when it's not. You can let go of that. And if people judge you for that, they're, they're not going to be people who stick around long in your life. Uh, and that leads us to the next one, which is let go of people and things that make your life harder. Uh, and letting go of them does not mean forever, but letting go of thinking that you're going to change people or that they're going to change and that suddenly they're going to make your, you know, stop making your life harder. Look, there are people who will be in your life that don't always make your life easy, right? But people who are genuinely trying to make your life harder, 
you know what I'm talking about. We've all got at least one or two people in our life that it's like, wow, seriously, do you need to make it harder? And letting go of those people, letting go of the expectation that you can change them, letting go of the expectation that it's suddenly going to be better. What about the things in your life? If there's stuff that's making your life harder, I, I will tell you one, one of the things that we did let go of early on, and I, and I cried a lot of tears over it. Um, we were living in a very small, small condo when when our son was diagnosed with autism and it had one of those train long living rooms so there was the living room and the dining room all together long and skinny and we needed a place for our son to do therapy and it was that room I know in other places people put it in another bedroom or we didn't have a space so it was going to be in that room and the, the dining room table was not going to work for our child to sit and do therapy he he needed a place where he could put his arm up and and write and work on writing skills and sitting up that you know with his legs touching the floor and that wasn't our dining room table and so we had to let go of the dining room table and there was a period of time when I took it down to the garage and thought okay you know it's gonna be in the garage and someday we're gonna have our dining room table back well you know eventually it was making it hard because I couldn't park the car in the garage because the dining room table was there and the parking on the street was so hard that some Sometimes I would have to circle for a half hour before I could park. It was ridiculous. And so I had to let go of the table. And yep, I cried, but I got more sleep and didn't use as much gas and it made things easier. So what's going on in your life that you could say, you know, I've tripped over this thing 32 times. It doesn't have a place. It doesn't have a place in my life right now. It's from a part of my life that I'm not in right now. Can I let go of it? And would my life be easier if I just let this go. I encourage you to look and see what you can. And then the last one, of course, which goes with everything, expectations that can only lead to resentment. Expectations are, I've heard, I have friends who say, expectations are planned resentment. Ah, you know, the expectation that we're suddenly going to be brilliant, that we're suddenly going to be able to do everything under the sun, that suddenly on top of everything, you know, for me, I'm just talking about my things that I'm going to be able to figure this all out by myself and not have to ask for anybody's help. Oh, that was a big one. That I was suddenly going to be a better housekeeper than I am. <sighs> that somebody was going to be able to help me uh, to figure all of that out, right? Letting it go. Letting it go and accepting everybody for who and where they are, accepting ourselves for who and where we are, accepting our child for who and where they are, and saying, okay, this is what is today. I'm letting go of all the rest of it about what I wish it was, what I want it to be, what I thought it was going to be, letting all of that go. And then looking at what it is, making peace with that and saying, okay, so what do I need to do about that? <sighs> That's a big stress relief. And then breathing about it and going, all right. That's what it is. What am I going to do? Okay. That's our stress tip for this week. I hope that you'll find something that you can put down. Something that you can say, you know what? I just don't have time or room for that. Can't do that right now. Put it down. All right. We're going to take a short, short break here and we're going to come back because I understand we do have Kim Grosso now and so we're going to talk to her about her blog, Autism in Real Life, but also this most recent blog, Five Reasons Why Autism Moms Rock. We're talking to you, so stick with us. Currently in the United States, one in 88 children is affected by autism. One in 88 means something different when your child is the one. Recovery is possible. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, host of Autism Live, an online show about autism broadcast by CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I'm also the mother of a child with autism, my beautiful son, Jem. You know our old joke, guess what? Chicken butt. Chicken butt. So we're going to take the chickens. But things weren't always so easy. I remember when Jem was first diagnosed with autism. I used to lay awake at night in bed and pray for someone or something that could help us to get our child back. 
My prayers were answered by Dr. Doreen Grandpiche and the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. CARD treats autism and other related disorders using the principles of ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, which is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. It is also recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the U.S. Surgeon General. About a year after we started treatment with CARD, we were able to see tremendous improvement, and we got our child back. What grade are you in? Second. You are a smart cookie, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you like school? Uh, yeah. Do you have any good friends? Yeah, Oscar. Oscar is your best friend? Yeah. And my child is just one of thousands to benefit from CARD ABA therapy. Across the nation and around the world, children are making amazing progress and being given the keys to unlock their full potential. We are extremely grateful for the amazing job CARD has done in helping our daughter. Our daughter today, just in four months, I think is a totally different child than when she started with CARD. I kind of see it as, it, it seems like her brain in a way was asleep and now that we've gotten so many services, um, we've seen her wake up. Did you have some guesses? <laughs> Recovery is possible if you take the right steps, um, if you're willing to put in all the hard work and seven and a half years, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It's worth every little bit and um, CARD's been there with us every step of the way. I have two children with autism. I can't imagine a day without CARD or the therapists. Um, they've been so instrumental in helping us with our kids and, and shaping their lives and helping us help them. Thank you, Christy and Big Alex. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie and Mariana. We've tried other things before ABA, but the most beneficial thing has been ABA services, and I'd be the first person to tell any newly diagnosed family that you have to you have to contact an ABA provider. And if you're lucky enough to have CARD, you're very blessed. Recovery from autism is absolutely a possibility. We've been recovering children for over 20 years. It's just a matter of identifying the child's medical needs, understanding the child's sensory issues, and then teaching the child all of the skills they need in order to function normally. We know there's hope for autism. Autism is treatable and recovery from autism is possible. Welcome back to Autism Live, and as promised, we have author and blog writer and autism mom, Kim Grosso, with us on Skype. Kim, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks. Kim, I'm so glad that you're here. You know, your blog came to my attention over the weekend because everybody was sharing this wonderful blog, Five Reasons Why Autism Moms Rock. Have to say, I saw the title and I was like, well, I need to read that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I want to know why I, I have my opinions about why we all rock, but I wanted to read. And it's a lovely, lovely blog. Uh, Thank you. And, you know, and, and in a second, I want to go over some of the things that you say in the blog. But uh, I, I, I loved the blog, and it was on Psychology Today. Is that correct? Yes. But yes. It, it said that you had uh, a, another blog, Autism in Real Life, that was the core blog. So I went to that and, and saw that you are very prolific and, and an autism mom, and that you're off also an author, that you have a new book. Yes. <laughs> well, we have to talk about that. I mean, <laughs> I want to, what, and tell us about, because I think this is wonderful. Tell us about the new book. Um, Kate's Dark Embrace is a paranormal romance um, that's with vampires, werewolves, definitely on the for adults. Okay. Um, and Luca's book is coming out. Another character is coming out in a few weeks, so his book's coming out in a few weeks. And um, I, I just, I always, I, I love to read, and I really wanted to write an autism book. And I actually had started writing one a real long time ago, but I just couldn't seem to put it together and I had been doing a lot of reading and just decided I was going to try my hand at writing fiction. Well, so. I think this is brilliant because we, we see so many parents who are out there that 
are brilliant with words. I don't know what it is. There are a lot of autism parents that are brilliant with words. I'm always amazed by that. And a lot of them are writing books about autism and that's wonderful. But I love the fact that that wasn't, you write great blogs about autism and you're a wonderful autism advocate. But I love the fact that you found something else to do because it can't always be about autism. It can't be. Um, so I love that. And we want to encourage people if you need something to read because we all need to take a vacation from autism at some point. I'm certainly going to check it out. And I said to you during the break, you're my hero. I want to write a fiction book this time. How much fun is this? A romance with vampires. Uh, first of all, it's productive and I hope you make a ton of money doing it. Thank and, you. You, and all <laughs> autism parents have to find a way to make extra money. But I'm imagining it was a mental vacation for you in a lot of ways. Um, definitely. And I mean, I think that, you know, what happens with a lot of autism parents is like me, I was, you know, when my son was diagnosed, I was in the corporate world. Mm. Um, you know, I was working a really serious job and it just got to the point after his diagnosis, probably by the time it was like five or six, I just could not, I could not work full time anymore and take care of all the things that he needed to do. Yeah. And probably like, I would say maybe three or four years later, five years, something like that. That's when I started the blog. Um, and the blogging or, you know, is, is great, but I think that, um, you know, having the book or writing, even about autism, if you want to, some people write autism mm -hmm. books and they donate the money. I mean, it, it's kind of a way if you want to write fiction that it's possible to make money if you get lucky. Yes. <laughs> I was an indie writer, but I'm just getting started and it's exciting. And there's a lot of great authors out there that I've been lucky to, you know, come in contact with and we all try and help each other. So, um, I think it's great if moms can find another, something else that they can do that also fits with the demands of, um, raising an autistic child. Absolutely. Um, I agree wholeheartedly. It's very difficult in the beginning. Absolutely. Well, I think it's absolutely brilliant. Tell us the name of both the books again and, and can we get them on Amazon? Yes, they're on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all romance books. They're uh, Cade's Dark Embrace is the first book and in a couple of weeks, Luca's Magic Embrace is coming out, and like I said, they are on the adult side, so okay. um, def not young adult books, but they're a good beach read. Okay, wonderful. We all need we all need those. So let's talk about this blog, Five Reasons Why Autism Moms Rock. What inspired this? Um, really, I was writing it for um, Mother's Day, and actually, a lot of my writing now is on the Psychology Today blog. Mm -hmm when I write about autism. So that one I was trying to write for Mother's Day, but of course, and I was reading it over again last night because it's been a while since I read it. And I noticed my ending, like I, it didn't come out on Mother's Day because May is like such a hard month at the end of the year with like a million things you have to do for school. So of yeah. course it didn't come out for that, but it really was for Mother's Day when I wrote that article. And I just have so many, I mean, like I said, my son's 15 years old now mm -hmm. so I've been at this since he was since he was two and a half and um, I have a lot of support within local autism support groups here and then people you meet on the internet too um, mostly if my uh, local autism support group and then also there's a lot of kids with autism in my son's um, typical school they're all at school together and I'm just amazed by moms how strong they are they all take on different causes, you know, sometimes they agree, sometimes they don't agree, but, um, and it's moms and dads, but since this was for Mother's Day, it, it was a mom's article. Mm -hmm. um, they're just very devoted, um, caring parents. You're all, you're all in. Yeah. Almost 100% of the time, um, trying to help your kids in every way you can. Yeah, and uh, you know, I love that. I'm going to go really quickly through the, the different things and have you comment on them. The first one is the, uh, the five reasons is you are fierce. <laughs> and, and I. 
And I think, you know, we all kind of laugh at that because uh, I've seen that, that little button about, you know, don't mess with me, I'm an autism mom. I've been to IEPs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> It, and we have to be, we have to be fierce. I, one of the women who uh, co-hosts one of the segments here with us is Nancy Allspot Jackson, and she recently had on her uh, wrist tattooed warrior uh, <laughs> to remind herself. And I love that because we've had to be, right? It's true. I mean, I think um, for me personally, well, it's, it's a lot of times it's uh, a challenge to get services yeah. for our kids. It's, it's not easy. And um, everybody, you know, has their own challenges, whether it's, you know, folks who are trying to approach this in a, um, you know, autism in a biomed way. I know a lot of moms identify being a warrior that way, or just for me personally, over the years, it's been fighting for services. Mm -hmm. It's just not a, an easy path. Yeah. And um, knowledge really helps, but then there's times where you just need to get an advocate to help you as well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, your second one is you have strength within. <laughs> Um, I guess, you know, I guess this just goes back to when your child first gets diagnosed, sometimes it can just be, it can be devastating. But I know for most of the moms that I know, they're just strong people within. And I'm sure they never said to themselves, they knew how strong they were going to be. Yeah. They, they are, they're just it just comes from within. Absolutely. They are strong because they have to be. I love and the, that's I, I, what it is. I agree. Your third one is you are smart cookies. I love that. <laughs> I think that just goes to having to know. I mean, from the very beginning, you're trying to learn about medical um, aspects. You're trying to, you know, understand what the doctors are telling you mm -hmm. and trying to also learn on your own and make your own decisions because you have to be the leader of all these different people who are trying to help you with your child, whether it's the doctor, the speech therapist, the OT, the teacher. You need to be in charge of that team for your son and the only way or your daughter and the only way you can do that is to be educated you need to Absolutely. learn special ed law you, need, you know it's yep. just there's so many things you need to learn yep you hit the ground running uh this one hits very home you never take anything for granted number four you know i just think that's that's one of the things you know every little um accomplishment we celebrate so much yeah. um you know, I mean, sure, you celebrate it with your neurotypical children, but there's some things, some milestones that just end up being delayed. So when you have something happen so amazing, and I've had some amazing times over the years with Tyler where I'm just like, I never take it for granted because I never really know what's going to happen yeah. um, with him. And so when great things happen, we, we definitely celebrate them. It's, but we don't, and we don't take it for granted that it's Absolutely. just going to happen. Absolutely. Now. And your last one, you know no boundaries when it comes to love. I think this goes for moms and dads. I mean, when you have a child and you're pregnant and you have all these dreams for this child, you don't even no yet um yeah. and then you know different things happen you're you just love the child no matter what you love the child no matter whether the child can you know is potty trained or not potty trained you, there there are no limits there are no conditions on it and that's you know, I think that you don't really learn about those things about your child or yourself until you have a child with special needs. Yeah. Well, Kim, love the blog, and you've got so many other great topics that you've written about. And if people go to autisminreallife.com, that's the, the right side, isn't it? Yeah, and a lot of my articles right now are on psychology 
today.com yeah. um, under autism in real life. And they can get there though from your autism in real life Jeez. and they can yeah. they can read more about the books and even click a link to be able to purchase the books from yes. autism in real life. So because I think that's great and I want to support you in that and Thank you. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read the first one and uh, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to talk to you again soon. But okay. I think you're wonderful. I think you are an autism mom that rocks and I, I'm glad I, we're on the same team. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. But good luck with the new book coming out. Thanks. Thank you. So that was mom, blogger, and author Kim Grosso. And we thank her so much for taking the time to be with us today on very short notice to talk about her blog, autisminreallife.com is the place where you want to go to learn more about Kim, read some of the article, other articles that she's read, and get her book. Let's read her book. Let's all have a beach read and some support another autism mom. We're going to take a break and come back after these messages. Well, we're the state's largest autism specific advocacy agency. We're almost 50 years old. We started with a group of parents almost five decades ago who needed help, needed answers. And now we're, uh, again, the state's largest nonprofit agency serving autism-specific issues, addressing autism-specific issues. One of the things we do is share information, and parents are desperate for credible and reliable information that leads to real services. So for decades, Autism New Jersey has had a 1-800-4-AUTISM number where anyone can call, but not just parents, professionals too. And you can ask a question about autism or you can ask for an autism service. Uh, we'll work you through our website. And to be included in our resource directory, you actually have to have the support of at least two other parents or two professionals who say, yeah, you were helpful and you were credible and you were reliable. Mm -hmm. And going forward, if we hear from more than one parent or professional that maybe your services didn't meet their expectations, we'll investigate that. Parents need access to credible and reliable information 24-7, so we have a website, okay. www.autismnj.org, okay. and we have the 1-800-4-AUTISM, and that's the number 4, 1-800-4-AUTISM. Okay. Wonderful. And when they call that number, who do they get? We're so excited. You get a compassionate, knowledgeable expert on autism, autism services, autism resources. But two of them just happen to be parents themselves of children with Asperger's and autism. And the third person is a professional who's a trained advocate. So you can't miss by dialing 1-800 for autism. Unfortunately, right now, we are business hours during the week because of funding cutback. Well, that makes sense. I mean, I was going to be amazed if you were 24-7. But we do have a partner called Mom to Mom in the state of New Jersey. And I'm so sorry I don't have that number with me right now. We'll I'll, find I'll, mom to Mom is a 24-7 helpline and when you dial that number 24-7 um, they'll be able to respond within seven seconds wow. of hearing the phone ring and they'll refer to us if it can wait. Proving that autism moms really do rock. I, I'm amazed on this journey, the, the moms and the dads that I meet and the things that they're, the obstacles that they're overcoming, the things that they suck up, right? Um, and go, well, you know, it just isn't going to be this way or it just isn't going to be that way. And oh, well, um, I, I have to say, you know, none of us picked being in this club. None of us. Nor do I think that many of us would have if we were given the choice. But I have to say that one of the blessings along the way, along with never taking anything for granted and really truly seeing the miracles that, that can happen, uh, it's been meeting the people on this journey. The, I, I always say I've yet to meet the autism parent that I didn't like. That hasn't happened yet. <laughs> I'm not saying that, you know, it couldn't ever happen, but I have yet to meet an autism parent that I didn't like. They're usually amazing, amazing people that are intelligent and thoughtful and considerate and that their hearts beat outside their bodies. 
So, and that they want to, and in general, they want to help not just their child, but everyone. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing group to be a, a, a part of. And I, I always say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that I'm on the same team with you guys because you are amazing. Uh, speaking of amazing autism parents, it's that time of the day when we show you the A word. This is an amazing documentary that's being made at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. Uh, they're following a little boy and his family. Jack Riley was two when he was diagnosed with autism. And we've gone back to the beginning. We kind of backtracked a little bit last week because a new episode had come out that I couldn't bear not to show you. But we've, we have gone back to the beginning and I think we're in episode six now. It's about a month into therapy with Jack Riley. And if you haven't watched the series, I'm gonna encourage you to go and watch the whole thing. Uh, it's a little on the addictive side, I'm gonna warn you. And in general, uh, uh, I like to keep a box of tissues around when I'm watching because sometimes it's a three hanky alarm. Um, but what you see is a family who's figuring it out and having their emotions and feeling all the different things that come along on this journey, but finding their way to the progress and enjoying the progress when they see it, dealing with things when when things aren't going well because it's not all hearts and flowers and roses but take a look this is the a word and we'll talk about it when we come back wow you have so many words today oh he's just blooming with language it's crazy he can say two syllable words now he can say purple guitar guitar uh, guitar before it was just tar now it's guitar so it's getting really close you can say pancake Pancake. Right? pancake. You can say butterfly. Wow. You can say butterfly. And when did this start? The two syllables. Um, I noticed it Monday, so four days ago. That he that he started to say on his own. What is this? What is this? Book. Book. Okay, there you go. There you go. And he's been managing for things, so that means asking for things a lot more now that he knows the label to. So book, guitar. And he's counting now. The words aren't clear, but they're the same every time. One day Cheryl said one, and he said two. And then she said two, and he said three. And, and then she came to me and said, he counts to ten. And I said, no, he doesn't. Yeah, he counts to ten. One. One. Yeah. Two. Two. Good. Go. 
That is the A word. I love to see those little baby toes. Is there anything better in life than little baby toes? Uh, and to see this child beginning to grow and learn and realize that things get better when he can communicate. Even now, at this point in the series, we see a shift. This child is starting to, well, he has learned how to learn. Um, there are things that they are specifically targeting, our word for today, um, in his lessons to learn and grow, and they're targeting manding, um, that he requests things, and that he asks for things, and that he, have, he has to in order to get them. Um, and we've, we always talk on the show about how there are a lot of byproducts that come from that when we're asking our children to request things and this is the question of the day was how does your child request things but when we really make sure that they they don't get anything without requesting for it lots of things will happen almost always we see challenging behavior reduce greatly why because once they see, oh, if I ask something, I get it, and it only takes that long, then that is an easier thing to do rather than tantrums. Sometimes the tantrum works, but wow, it's amazing that every time I ask for it, they're giving it to me. We just have to make sure that we make that equation true. Every time I ask for it, I get it. And hopefully when, I tan when the child is tantrum, they never get it. Um, hopefully. That's really our responsibility at this point in the game when manding is being taught. Don't give it for the tantrum, but every single time give it when they mand appropriately. So then the challenging behavior diminishes because the child begins to recognize this isn't working. And, and, you know, whether they're recognizing it on that high level, they do recognize it and change their behavior. Um, and other things start to happen, too, that children often will automatically start to work harder on their diction because if saying cookie gets me the cookie, I want to make sure that I say it in a way that the person understands. We've all seen a child on the spectrum, off the spectrum, at a certain age, saying something clearly trying to communicate and asking for something and the other person is standing there clearly wanting to give it to them but they don't know what the child is saying right and what we see is that our kids you know the they want to make the effort to be understood like all of us um, so here we have a little boy that they haven't targeted teaching two syllable words I mean they've been offering him anytime he asks for something saying the word along with it. So if he's requesting the guitar, the therapist is saying guitar, right? And saying it in two syllables. So it's not as if it's not being taught, but they're not targeting specifically for him to say two syllable words. And, in the, and a week ago, he was saying tar. She was saying guitar and he was saying tar. And she was giving it to him because we reward approximations. But already before, you know, at a certain point, she would have said gi and tar to get him to say it, but we weren't even there and he's starting to say two syllables on his own because he sees, oh, when I do this, I get the things that I want. And from there, you know, it's like pizza dough. They're just gonna spread this out to so many other things. Does it mean that he's never gonna have a moment when he goes, I don't wanna do this? Oh, unfortunately not, <laughs> right? But what we're going to see as the weeks go on is that when he gets off track, she's going to be able to very gently negotiate him back on track and remind him, not with words, but with her actions, that when you do these things, it's like the light switch goes on and the party happens. All the things that you want in life are there. All the good sh stuff shows up when you do these behaviors, whatever the target is. So really very remarkable. Uh, you know, we were just talking with mom blogger Kim Grasso about how as autism parents, we don't get to take anything for granted. And I say to you that there are many, many parents whose children started manding 
and they noticed it the first time and then didn't notice afterwards. And maybe their child started to say two syllable words and they noticed it or they didn't notice it, but they didn't notice it for very long. We don't get that luxury as autism parents. We get to notice it all and feel it all. But you know what? That certainly has the potential to be one of the pluses as we journey through this, um, that we get to notice and go, look at that. He's saying two syllable words. There's been progress. There's a shift. And do you notice in the video that he's interacting more with the people in the first couple of weeks, he's got the toys and he's off someplace else, but he's starting to notice the people. Why? Because the people are the one that give him the things. <sighs> and they're doing a very good job of consistently having praise, be partnered whatever, with whatever the reinforcement is. So he's starting to notice our reactions that, oh, we're happy. We're happy when you do that. That's the beginning little kernel that's going to help him to, as we see, if you go and watch the episodes now, he's more interested in people than he is in things. And he's starting to notice when you and I are happy or unhappy and that he can change his behavior and change us. That's some perspective taking. That's some theory of mind. That's going to help with self-regulation and with a whole host of other lessons. Uh, but here we are. It's just the beginning. Watch the episodes. They have their own uh, YouTube channel. Go back and watch it. It's so, it's inspirational. And if you haven't started an ABA program yet, watch this to see and I understand it's with a small child. It's that early intervention. And some of you have older kids and we're looking for, I'm still, I still have them, but we're looking for those videos with the older kids because these, with slight differences, these techniques work with the older kids as well. All right. We have to take a break. When we come back, we, we are finally, because I promised on Thursday and Friday, we never got to it. We're going to look at some of your answers to the questions of the day because we've missed several days. So stick with us. My son. My son. My brother. My daughter is one of the one in 88 children. On the autism spectrum. I have autism. I have autism. I have autism and I want you to see me as an individual and not as a label. I want to find out why my brother has autism. I want the government to say that autism is a public health crisis. I need to know who will take care of my child when I'm gone. I want to know what treatments, what solutions are out there for my child. We need insurance reform in all 50 states. I want autism to be an unavoidable topic for those running for office this fall. I want my students to be safe in school. I want the bullies to leave me alone. Autism Speaks encourages all Americans to ask candidates, how will you make a difference for those living with autism? I want a Senate. A president. A Congress. That recognizes autism as an urgent public health crisis it is. I want our lawmakers to listen. Make your voice heard this election. Visit autismvotes.org. Welcome back to Autism Live. I hope that you are going to autismvotes.org. That video that we just showed you, uh, you'll find it there. And we really want to encourage you to go there. I know you just saw it, it was short. And it's a lovely video and features some of the people that we've had on the show before. I hope you saw Carrie Magro in there. Lovely young man, moving and shaking, changing the world uh, on the spectrum. Gotta love that. And many other people that are on the video. But uh, you, here is where you have the ability to make a difference right now right here today we showed you the video and it's not about that you've seen the video but if you will go and click the button on the site and there's a link there and watch that video uh, and Emily's giving you the address right there watch that video what it does is it puts another view on it and share it, put it on Facebook, talk about it with people, send it to all of your friends who don't have children on the autism spectrum and send a little note and say, could you do me a favor? Could you please watch this video for 60 seconds or just put it on? You can walk someplace else. But as a group of people, we need to build the number of how many people have watched this video. The hope is to get to a million and we need to get to a million because we're in an election year. And if you think for a second that the outcome of this election in either direction is not going to impact our children, 
I, you know, I, we, we have no ideas, right? And part of the reason why we have no idea how it's going to impact is because they're not talking about it. Neither candidate is talking about it. And whichever side you're on, we need to get, or even if you're undecided, these candidates need to talk about it. They need to hear from us. It's that squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Let's be squeaky wheels together. And this is something that we can all put our, our attention into. It's free. Take you 60 seconds. Go and add your number to the ticket and ask everyone that you have any influence over to add their number to the ticker so that we can say a million people want to know what are you going to do. We, we have a very limited amount of time before the election. By the way, Shelly Hendricks, who uh, is the head of Autism Votes, is going to be joining us here on October 10th. Um, she'll be here during Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, with Nancy Allspot Jackson and I. And if you can't wait for that, Shelly is also going to be my guest on my radio show, Everyday Autism Miracles, this afternoon at 4 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Uh, if you have questions for Shelly, you know, you can either ask them here on the 10th or you can call into the radio show Everyday Autism Miracles this afternoon. But whether what I, you know, and again, not to politicize autism, but why isn't anybody talking about it? One in 88 can't wait. I think we're, no matter where you are in this, I think we're all in agreement on that. And by the way, that one in 88 is a very old number, a very old number. So please uh, go and watch that video. Add your number to the number. Let's get to a million as soon as possible. Okay, uh, I'm so excited because we are going to finally uh, go over some of your answers to the questions of the day recently. So uh, starting out, today's question was, how does your child request things that they want or need? And a couple of people wrote in and said uh, that their son will bring the object to them if he needs help or, or if he wants something. If I need to go do it, uh, talking from the parent's point of view, he will grab my hand and pull me where he wants me to go. Okay, well, you know, what that says to me is this is a child who wants to communicate. Now that's the wonderful. I, I hope that you're working at, you know, giving him skills that are even easier, whatever that is, uh, you know, whether that's working towards the vocal or working towards a picture iconic or a device or something, because imagine if you, if you know how wonderful that he's doing that, let's just talk about how miraculous that that is. But imagine if you had to do that every time you wanted to ask somebody something, I would imagine that that would get really frustrating. And I'm sure it's frustrating for you to, um, not knowing what, what he wants and when he wants it, but being led to it. Right. Uh, another person who says that their child will bring him, bring his cup when he wants a drink or his bowl when he's hungry again, you know, I mean, that is manding that is manding and that can be worked with and morphed into, uh, I, uh, other forms of communication. I'm just scrolling down here on this site to see in terms of, because there was one question of the day the other day. Ah, here it is. Um, uh, the question was, if you could get a grant for $1,000 to $5,000, what would you use it for? Uh, somebody said therapy. Another person said speech therapy. Uh, uh, another person said, now that we've had major success with ABA, I'd use the money toward cord blood therapy. Uh, we've got somebody that we uh, were talking to that I'm going to have uh, on the show at some point very soon uh, whose child did that. And so I want to hear directly from a parent. Another person says, I would donate it to the reality series Fix It in Five with Lynette Louise, a.k.a. The Brain Broad. So she could finish editing and we could see the episodes already. The teasers are, well, teasing me. Ah, okay. I don't know this show because obviously it hasn't been finished. So very interesting. We'll look forward to that. The Brain Broad. 
there whoa that's pretty fascinating uh, another person says music lessons speech and by a piano how very interesting uh, another person said I would use it for things my son really needs to help him communicate with us uh, would love to know what what kinds of things whether you're looking for a tablet or um, and I'm gonna go to one of the other sites here one of the reasons why I always have a reason right uh, I asked you guys if you could have a grant between a thousand and five thousand dollars is that uh, there are organizations that give grants for between a thousand and five thousand uh, dollars one of and actually for less than that obviously if you don't need a thousand dollars but one of the organizations uh, that I'm referring to is autism care and treatment today that Nancy Allspot Jackson is the executive director of. They're not in a grant phase right now, but they will be again soon. And I want to have you mindful of what would you ask for a grant for. They're about to have their big fundraiser, Denim and Diamonds, which is where they get the core of their money for grants. Um, and I, you know, I like to think about what's that, what's that going for? Uh, so in another place here, uh, talking about uh, how does your child request things they want or need, somebody says, uh, talking device that she, she has one and types it out to us. It's functional communication, that's brilliant. Another person who says, sometimes with PEX cards, which are picture exchange communication system, a few words or brings me the milk juice or something else. Often we remind him to use your words and he does, fabulous. Another person says sometimes he uh, he's usually been getting it out with asking, getting it without asking. Okay, um, okay, and you know that's a really important thing. And thank you for being honest about that because I think at some point we've all been on that page, right? On that day when we were just giving things to our child without asking. But that is a shift that we need to make as parents. And at a certain point, you know, we want to be teaching them the appropriate way and prompting them to do the appropriate way and rewarding approximations, but we need to make them ask for it. It's how we get to that first progress. Uh, another person who says, usually she does not ask, she will go get it herself. When she is directed out of the fridge or out of someplace, she shouldn't be without asking, she has a meltdown. What I have tried to do is redirect her and ask what she wants, but only after the meltdown has stopped while I answer her or get her what she wants. You probably notice in the A word when we watch that, that there is a baby gate into the kitchen. We had the baby gate too. It wasn't something that we were asked to do, but it was something that we had because, first of all, I, I couldn't keep all the things in the kitchen safe. My child was somebody who took things apart. Like, I, you know, he could get past all the little uh, child safety locks and everything, um, but he wasn't able, because, and we had like a professional baby gate, not something you go buy at a store, a professional baby gate installed that you know, <laughs> was hard for us to open it, let's be honest. Um, really, you know, and we made sure that any screwdrivers or anything stayed on the other side of the kitchen wall so that my son couldn't dismantle it because he would have considered it. Um, so he couldn't get in the refrigerator. And not only that, we had a Velcro thing that was on the refrigerator that even if he had made it to the refrigerator, he couldn't get in the refrigerator. Um, so that he had to ask, he had to ask. And, and originally, you know, before we had therapists come into our home, my son would stand there and rattle the gate if you just did this to it it would make a rattling metal noise and that's how you know he would ask for things and we had to stop we had to completely put that on extinction so that we didn't acknowledge that at all um, and that he had to find a way to communicate with us it really was the roadmap to back so ask yourself if there's a way that you can head that off at the past so that it's not when the child's in the refrigerator and you're pulling them out right because that's it's going to become a battle. Um, but is there a way that you can cut off access to the refrigerator so that she has to ask to get into, into the room to do the refrigerator? Some houses are harder than others. Uh, another person says, how do their, their child ask for things finger pointing? Uh, somebody else says, both of my grandchildren have devices to talk with and my grandson knows to use it for what he wants or needs. My granddaughter only tells you what she did that day. She doesn't request things, but will get your hand and take 
take you to where she is asking for. See, and what's great about this is that that's, she is requesting though. Um, but if there's a way that you want it to be easier, then you, you know, we need to set the limit and say you have to, in little increments, not big ones, no cold turkey, but in little increments so that if she's leading you over, great, hand her the device and say, tell me, and then you give it to her. It's tough, it's tough. Um, and they're frustrated in the beginning, but then they make progress, just like when they didn't walk and they were frustrated and they stood up and they fell down and they hit their head on the coffee table and it was upsetting, but we didn't say to them, okay, well, you're just not gonna walk. We can't do that with this either. Um, and they are communicating, so the good news is they're trying, they get it. Another person says she's 10 and for some things she will just use one word like juice to request, which is great and always can be built on, right? We want to reward, reward those approximations and then build on it. Uh, I'm going to read just a couple more because we're running out of times. Um, Sometimes the boys get what they want and bring it to me, and other times they use their words to ask, um, which is fabulous. Even when they bring it to you, encourage them to ask you for it, right? And then give it to them. We gotta be as consistent as we can. Another person says, sometimes he just says it, other times we have to figure out why he's having a tantrum. Uh, depends on the day, yeah, it does. But uh, you know, the more we make them a request, the less those tantrums go away. There's so many of these that I wanna read and I really want to read all the things that you guys wrote to the how you would spend that money. I hope you guys will go on Facebook and look around and see some of the things that people said because it's so inspirational. Uh, you guys are my heroes. I, I, I hope, and I, I started to say, you know, we talked about the grants, uh, autism care and treatment gives grants, um, but also United Healthcare, oddly enough, <laughs> um, gives grants for up to $5,000 for parents for things that are uh, medically related and proven to be effective. So there has to be some science behind it, but they'll give grants for up to $5,000 and you don't have to be a, a client of United Healthcare. It's their United Healthcare Children's Fund. So depending on the things that you want, there are two, and by the way, ACT Today gives grants for all kinds of things, uh, medically uh, based things, trampolines, fences, devices, they let the parents tell them what they want. In the United Healthcare one, it has to be things that are medically related and have been shown to be effective. Uh, just so just throwing it out there uh, United Healthcare Children's Fund is what it is and autism care and treatment today is www.act today t-o-d-a-y dot org all right let's take a break when we come back we're going to talk about our language tip for the for the day teaching our children to understand yes and no so stick with us I'm Joe Montaigne as a father of a daughter with autism, I know the challenges that brings. Military families impacted by autism wage a battle on two fronts. One for their country, and another for their children. I know you God knows we're in a battle zone. Well, I'm fighting the war back here, and I'm fighting it all alone. With one in 88 military children diagnosed with autism, the families face extraordinary challenges. But there is hope. With intensive treatment, the lives of children with autism and their families can be changed. You can make a difference. The day we've all been waiting for. Maybe to learn how you can help a military child with autism, go to acttodayformilitaryfamilies.org. Thank you. Maybe tomorrow. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and it's time for our language tip of the week. And we're talking today about yes and no. And there are some things to consider when we're teaching yes and no to our kids. And I made a list here. Uh, I'm, my lighting is such that I'm having trouble reading my list today, uh, but there it is. Uh, and, okay, so here, here are the different things uh, that we wanna talk about today. We talk about establishing operations. It's really important when we're teaching yes and no to be very mindful of 
of what we're establishing. So if we're, to, we're in a circumstance where we're trying to teach for a child to say yes to something, so I say, do you want juice? And, and what I, that's my target is that I want the child to say yes. Okay. And so I'm saying to her, do you want juice? I have to be mindful of how much juice has this child had recently? I got to set myself up for success. So I either want to set up a state where the child hasn't had juice if I want them to answer yes, or if my target is teaching no, then I want to be able to set up a circumstance in which the child is going to say no to something. Why would a child ever say no to juice? They would say it if they'd already had a bunch of it, right? So I, I want to make sure that whatever state I, whatever my target is I've set up a state around in the environment, an establishing operation, an EO as they call it, that's going to make me more likely to be successful. And we'll talk about that as either, either being something we've set up a state of uh, deprivation or of satiation. And you'll hear people talking about that. So, and uh, all we need to understand is if I want them to say yes, then it has to be something that they haven't had tons of access to. And if I want them to say no, I want it to be something that they've had their fill of or that they don't like. And so our next clue is to start with highly preferred objects or highly aversive objects. So, you know, if I want the child to say yeah, and we're not trying to torture anybody, let's be 100% sure about that. Um, so this is not about, you know, doing something that's painful or horrible or whatever. But if we want the child to say yes to something, then I'm not going to stand there and offer them chocolate milk if they hate chocolate milk. And yes, there are some people who hate chocolate milk. Um, but if I know the child loves chocolate milk and chocolate milk is okay for them, I'm not going to give them any chocolate milk that morning. But then when I go to teach yes, I, I'm going to say to them, do you want chocolate milk? Because I'm more likely to get a yes to chocolate milk than I am for water for this particular child. Um, but likewise, you know, we've seen in, in, um, the videos with Jack Riley that he loves to eat bananas chopped up, but a banana hole and in the skin is upsetting to him. For, for whatever reason, he doesn't want a banana. So I know that if I said to him, do you want a banana? I'm more likely to get a no, and I'm more likely to get him to say no for that. Um, so we start with highly preferred or highly you know, things that aren't preferred. I and mean, we have aversive, but don't think in terms of connotation of something that's just horrible, right? We don't want to upset them. Uh, we want to carry out wrong responses. You know, a lot of times we talk about, you know, trying to response block so we don't get a wrong response or uh, not paying any attention to wrong responses. But when we're teaching yes and no, we want to be 100% clear and we got to keep our consequences clear. So if I'm sitting there and a lot of times when kids are starting out, they don't know what yes means. They don't know what no means. They really don't. So we want to teach them. So if I'm standing there with a highly preferred object, it's applesauce and the child loves applesauce and they haven't had applesauce today. And I say, do you want applesauce? And I'm going to wait to see if the child responds. I might prompt and say, say yes in the beginning, right? But at some point I'm going to be teaching no too. So, and I'm teaching them to, uh, it's on here as well that we want to encourage nodding to say yes and no, to get the gesture with it, right? <laughs> hand in hand, encouraging it. It doesn't have to happen, but we want to encourage it. But so if I say to the child, do you want applesauce? And the child says no, then I go, okay. And I want to remove the applesauce that may not be what the child meant, right? The child is learning yes and no and can't discriminate between the two of them. And so the child may start to fuss. So I've taken it away. So the consequence for saying no is you don't get it, right? And, and so the child might start to fuss. Now I can reintroduce the question and say, do you want applesauce? And I might prompt and say, say yes. And when the child does, they get the applesauce, right? But we do have to carry out whatever they said. So if they said yes, if I say to Jack Riley, do you want the banana? And he says yes, he gets the banana and he might toss it away, but you know, but I still have to give it to him so that he starts to see the consequences for yes and no. Again, we're not trying to torture anybody, but we carry it out just for a millisecond and then we can represent the question. Do you want the banana? Say no. Okay, no banana, right? Uh, and that's how we're going to help them to differentiate because we're not 
we're not going to assume that they're just going to know it. They, our kids don't pick things like that up. Um, okay, I mentioned before we're going to encourage nodding with every response. So we're going to model it and, you know, and we're going to, if they understand receptively, we can say nod your head and say yes, yes or no, no, right? Uh, we really want to encourage and reinforce modeling. Uh, and we want to always modify appropriately for our non-vocal children because we're trying to get everybody to be verbal and remember verbal is any kind of interaction, any kind of communication. So, you know, we talk about all these things in terms of saying yes and saying no with the head nod, but we don't have to wait until a child is already vocal to work on these things. We can work on these things with a child who's nonverbal, but we're just going to change uh, things to be appropriate for that circumstance. So, and you've made a decision, hopefully, when you're starting to teach this of what your target is. Uh, so if it's that you want the child to say vocally yes, great. If it's that you want the child to point to a text card that says yes, great. If you want them to point to a text card that says yes and has a happy face, fabulous. If you want them to sign the word yes, which I think is this, I don't remember, is that what it is? Um, you know, but decide beforehand what the target is that's appropriate for this individual child and that's what you teach each time. It's just fill in the blank. Um, you know, imagine it if I was saying, okay, we're going to teach this to a child in Spanish. Obviously, you know, we may not teach them yes, we may teach them C. If we're going to teach it in French, we're going to teach it we. Oui. These are all different languages. So signing or pointing to an icon or pushing a button on a computer, those are other languages too. But you just need to be clear about what is the target. Uh, and we want some sort of functional communication that gives the child the ability to say yes or no to something. Um, later on, after we've gotten them to be able to say yes or no to things that they want, then we're going to work on getting them to respond correctly to yes or no. But this is the groundwork that we lay here, getting them to communicate yes and no in whatever way that we can. All right, there is our language tip for today. We're going to take a break and be back after these messages. Autism used to affect one in every 10,000 children. Now it affects one in every 91 kids. Talka is one of five organizations helping families living with autism today. Our kids came back to life. There's a whole community out there, and now we're a part of it. Oh, Taka has a place for me. To find Taka, go to www.takanow.org. Please. Welcome back to Autism Live. You just saw Lisa Ackerman from Taka. Taka? I, it depends on where you're from, I guess how you say it. Uh, I hope that it's a site that you visit. It's a wonderful resource. We had Lisa on the show just a couple of weeks ago, and you can watch that interview as well. An amazing autism mom. Uh, okay. It is time for us to talk about success at school. Uh, we usually talk about this on Mondays, different strategies for how we can help our children to be as successful as possible at school. And sometimes that means something that you do for your child. Sometimes it means something you do for yourself. Sometimes it means you do something for the teacher or the school at large. But today's tip is if possible, this is not another thing to just like heap it on your list of things to do. But one of the things that you can do to create success at school is to volunteer. Uh, I think, you know, and we've got some guidelines for you here that first and foremost, before anything else, is to ask yourself when and where is that appropriate. If you've got five children and they're all on the spectrum and you spend the greater portion of your day driving around, dropping them off, picking them up and doing all kinds of things, you may look at this and go, I don't have time. And you know what? 
I agree with you. So that would be a, it's just not appropriate. And you know, it can be one of those things where you say, I don't have time this year, or I don't have time this week, or I don't have time this month. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's forever, but to have the maturity to say, I can't right now. I can't right now. For this year, for the first time, my son's in fourth grade, and this year, for the first time, I'm the room mom. And I said that to somebody the other day, and they said, well, that's just crazy. How could you have never been the room mom before? You don't strike me as a person who could handle that, that you would need to be the room mom. And I said, you know what, quite honestly, I think when he was in kindergarten, I volunteered to be the room mom, and that a wonderful kindergarten teacher said to me, uh, you know what, I have two other parents who would like to do that and it seems like you got a lot of other stuff to worry about. Why don't you let them? Because <laughs> I couldn't have a boundary for myself. Um, you know, it wasn't appropriate for me that year. Does that mean that I didn't volunteer at all? No. I volunteered in the ways that were right for me. And so that's our second tip is to consider what you have to offer. I read a very funny post of a friend of mine on Facebook, somebody who is a wonderful television executive, uh, working in television right now and has three children, one on the spectrum. And she wrote in and said, okay, seriously, you know, I'm a very capable woman. Why is it that I can go into a kindergarten class and, and the, uh, to volunteer and the teacher gives me an assignment to go and laminate something, Xerox it, laminate it, and poke holes in it to bind it? And she said, I felt like I was so overwhelmed and that I was in tears in the copying room saying, I'm a very capable person. How could this have happened to me? <laughs> <laughs> that this has completely sunk my battleship. And we all wrote it and said, oh, you know, no, seriously, seriously. Um, because a lot of the things that you might be asked to do in a classroom may not be in your skill set. And you know what? First of all, it's okay to say that. Uh, second of all, it's okay to say, you know, I'm willing to try. I'm willing to try. This is not my area of expertise, but I'm willing to try. And sometimes that's a good thing for you to get out and do something that's outside your experience and the laminators at schools. I, it's overwhelming. Um, but what I also have learned over the years and other people helped me to see this is that tell people what you're good at, you know, and tell them what you like to do. If there's something, if there's something that you can fill a need, then, then go and do that. I remember spending one afternoon in the teacher room trying to cut pieces of paper to a certain specification so they could make this big calendar and they had a list of, you know, I, I need 42 pieces of blue that are 8 inches by 8 inches and I need 75 strips of red that are 2 inches by 60. Oh my goodness. And I was the second or third parent that they had sent into the room and I left babbling. Uh, <laughs> this is horrible. Uh, but you know, I found that there are other things that I can do that are less stressful for me and that are actually fun for me and that are within my skill set. Um, and all of those things help our kids. And you might ask yourself why? Um, because then people know you're on campus, the other kids know you're there, the kids love it when there's adults there. And they're nicer to our kids when we show up, when they feel like they know us and we've looked at them, they spend more time with our kids. The teachers know that we're a parent that cares and wants to be helpful and useful. Um, so it does have, even if you're in the copy room doing something and you're not there for your child, it does have an impact on your child. Um, and my last one is to consider what is best for your child's needs. One of the things that I discovered um, especially when he was in kindergarten, I spent a lot of time in the classroom and helping with centers because that's really what needed to happen in kindergarten. But what I discovered was that my son's behavior was not as good when I was there, which is a sad thing, right? 
Um, that's not my favorite thing, but it, I, I spend less time in his classroom in those kinds of capacity because he doesn't always do well with it. Like I'm not the person to work with him. Um, that sometimes I come in and do something with somebody else. Um, and that that's a good thing for him. He sees that I'm there and, and we have rules about how he has to behave when I'm there. Um, but ultimately what I decided to do was to volunteer my time for things in other classrooms. And and you might think, well, that is just weird. <laughs> and it is. And at first I was like, why would I do that? But it really ended up being the best possible thing for my child um, because he got to make friends with a whole bunch of people that he wouldn't have made friends with. They looked out for him. They were older kids. They were kind to him. They uh, helped him on the playground. And it was a really good for thing for me personally. And it was a good thing for us within our school setting for people to see that we weren't just about our child. A lot of times in my IEP meeting and I'm fighting for things for my child. Um, and to, for that, for the people in the school setting to see that we weren't just about our child, we're about all the children, but we are going to advocate for our child. Uh, I think it helped people to know where I was coming from. Um, so when I ask for things for my child that I don't seem quite the persnickety, horrible person that I may have come across that on occasion. <laughs> just saying. So can you volunteer? Do you have the time? Are you willing to? I think that you'll find that when you do, first of all, we were talking earlier about, you know, taking a vacation from autism to go in and help a group of kids in a classroom. It can be overwhelming. It absolutely can. Uh, but it can be very, very rewarding for you and your child and all the other kids as well could be a beneficial thing. Uh, we're going to take a break and when we come back, we're going to do our funding tip, which is also about volunteers, but how to help you get volunteers to help you with your child. Uh, interesting concept, right? Stick with us. Hi, I'm Bryce Myler and I'm the Contracts Director for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I've been here for about five years. CARD has several employees with many years of insurance experience uh, dealing with insurance, dealing with pre-authorizations, dealing with discovering whether there's coverage or not. So we have more experience than any ABA provider that I've ever come across. So for, for a prospective client, somebody that may be interested in you know ABA therapy and what CARD has to offer, we have a special 800 number um, and you call that number. They will talk to you about what we have to offer, uh, how ABA works, they'll ask you for the front and back of your ID card and then we check to see if you do or do not have coverage. If you have coverage for ABA therapy, we try to do whatever we can to set it up where we can bill for you and you don't have to fight with the insurance company every month to get your claims paid. For California residents, we recently did a series of insurance trainings all over the state and you can click on the link below to watch pretty much the full presentation. It has a lot of information how you can get your insurance company to to comply with what they're supposed to do, uh, understanding the networks and many other um, valuable pieces of information. Welcome back to Autism Live. It's that time of the week when we talk about funding. This is a huge issue and a lot of times you guys write in um, and I ask you to write in to tell us what are your funding issues and what, my phone's ringing, uh, <laughs> what are your funding issues and what do you need uh, to be able to get to an ABA program? Like what is holding you back? What's preventing that from happening? And, I'll, and not all the time, but a lot of times you guys will write in and say funding, 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 funding. Sometimes it's access to a program that you don't have a provider near you. Um, and sometimes it's both of those things, which seem insurmountable, right? What are you going to do about that? If you have, you don't have insurance reform where you are, um, and so you don't have uh, any providers because they tend to go hand in hand. In, where insurance is, the providers tend to go. Um, and so here you are sitting someplace in the world, there's no providers that are close by, and even if there were providers close by or providers a little bit further away, you don't have the money to be able to afford it and you have no funding source. Um, so what do you do then? Do you just give up? And of course the answer to that is we don't give up. We never give up, right? Um, 
And what we have seen, uh, this is not personally the way in which I did it because I didn't have to. I lived in a state where we had funding and we had providers, but there are people around the world that are doing ABA programs, intensive ABA programs with their children, with its trained staff in their home, and it's completely volunteer staffed. I know, isn't it shocking? Isn't it exciting? Don't you want to know these people? Um, and from time to time, we show a video of a, a family, um, Maddie, a little girl who ha was diagnosed with autism and the family was living in a place where they didn't have access and they didn't have funding. And they were trying to make it work on their own and had volunteers and they were reading as much as they could. You want to talk about taking the crash course and buying books and trying to figure out put together a curriculum and it was right about that time that Dr. Jonathan Tarbox who you see on the show on Fridays happened to be doing a, a, a series of talks in different places around the country and he was giving a talk in this community and I don't know whether it was the mom or the dad came and heard him speak and it was right when the skills program was coming out and the cardio learning program was coming out and he said to them you know here is this amazing tool that we're trying Trying to do for people who live too far away. Uh, a tool, Cardi Learning, to be able to train whoever you need to train yourself and your whole staff. And skills, which is the curriculum, everything that you could need with the progress charts um, to help you to teach a child and not have to go figure it out on your own. You take the assessment and, and you've got um, a pool of lessons to choose from that are appropriate for your child. And uh, with teaching points and, you know, uh, the full the full bore and the progress charts and the whole thing and so Maddie's family who was already trying to do this on their own embraced that and said how fabulous and they set about teaching their volunteers at, at, with the Cardi Learning and using the skills program to great success um, so that their child made tremendous progress and they didn't pay any of their staff they were all volunteers. And you might think, okay, that is an amazing story, because it is, but they're not the only ones. We just show video of them. Um, and over the years, there have been many, many people who have found ways to get volunteers to work with their children. So, you know, you might be saying to yourself, well, how am I gonna raise the money? Maybe, maybe in your circumstances, maybe there's a way that it becomes not a funding issue. Maybe instead of looking for money, you might consider looking for volunteers. Years. Just throwing it out there and here's some suggestions of some things that have worked for people in the past. Um, going to different community organizations and asking for help and support. You know, the list is long of all the organizations. There are all kinds of humanitarian and philanthropic organizations in every single community that part of their mission is outreach into the community and to be of help and support of people in the community. Community. And unless you tell them, here's what I need, they might not know. But uh, we've heard of people going to their local Elks group and uh, the, the Shriners are going to, uh, I'm trying to think, Knights of Columbus, those kinds of organization, uh, even the Rotary Club. We've heard of Rotary Clubs who have, you know, said, here's how much time and we can split it amongst us and made a commitment, like a two-year commitment to stay staff volunteers um, because they belong to these organizations so that they can be of help. These are people who get it that when you give and when you help, you feel better. They want to help your child. I'm going to get emotional that there are people out there who do want to help our kids. Do we want to be careful about who we invite into our homes? Absolutely. We always want to have a baby monitor. We want to vet everyone. We want to make sure that it's safe, but there are people who truly want to help your child and they want to help your child just for the pleasure of helping your child. There are other people out there who desperately need work and they know they can't get it unless they're trained. And if you're offering free training, that's enough for them to be willing to volunteer their time. Um, 
you know? So you can look in, in, in both those areas. Uh, asking family and friends. We have heard of many occasions where people have, have said to a wide group of friends and said, here's what we're about to do in our home. We're about to do an intensive ABA program and we're looking for volunteers and being very clear and saying, we need somebody who can volunteer this much time. Here's what you're going to learn and you're going to help change a bunch of lives because we change this child's life, which means we change this family's life, which means we change the world because this child goes out into the world and interacts with the world. That is changing the world. Uh, and there are people who want to be a part of that because it's amazing. Um, and asking friends and family, uh, you know, I, like I said, I didn't need to do this, but I remember while my son was having ABA, I was riding to a work event, event with a woman who I'd never met before, and she was telling me about her daughter who was about uh, to, she was start, about to start her second year of college, and that she wanted to be a pediatrician when she grew up grew up, I mean, you know, second year of college, she wanted to be a pediatrician, and that uh, she was working at a store and getting minimum wage and not having enough time for her classwork and was taking all these psychology classes. And I said, this young woman should be a therapist. Uh, and she is today. She is a therapist and uh, I believe is in graduate school at this point and will be the pediatrician that both you and I want to take our children to, right? Because she'll have worked with our kids for years and years before she's a pediatrician. Fabulous. There are people out there who want that experience. Uh, and then, of course, going to college students and other organizations uh, on the college level, we've heard of sororities who have adopted a child in terms of saying, this is our community service project for the next two years. We're going to have a rotating schedule and train all of the sorority sisters in ABA techniques um, so that we can be the volunteers. And, you know, each sorority sister maybe, you know, donates between six and eight hours. And together, the house changes what happens with this child. Amazing. Nobody gets paid. And then, of course, uh, what we saw with Maddie's family was that they went to their church and said, hi, here we are. We have a child here that's a part of your community and we need some help. Who's got the time? And that people overwhelmingly said, you're part of our community. We, we want to be here for you. And I think, you know, uh, we had a camera crew there that was able to videotape a lot of things. And what we heard overwhelmingly was that it was a gift to everyone, that the people who volunteered were thrilled with having been a part of that. So maybe if this is just another way of looking at the equation. Is this right for everyone? No, but it might be right for you. And I think it's important for us to sometimes step outside the box and look and go, you know, maybe raising enough money and getting an ABA provider here isn't going to happen fast enough. Is there another way? And this is another way. And people have done it. You wouldn't be the first person. Uh, something to think about. Okay, uh, we're here at the end of the show, and so there's a couple of things housekeeping-wise that I want to point out to you guys about some things that are going to be happening this week and in the coming weeks. Uh, we are, the rest of this week, we've got some really exciting interviews coming up for you. Of course, we're going to have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox on Friday at 11 o'clock. We've got Angela Persicky, who's a BCBA, that will be with us on Thursday at 11 o'clock. On Wednesday morning, uh, in the first hour, we're going to have Evelyn Gould, who's a BCBA, a board certified behavior analyst. And Evelyn is superlative at, at letting us be who we are and coming to this event of autism with the knowledge that we have and with. Uh, She's just forgiving, <laughs> let's say that. She's just incredibly forgiving of, uh, and accepting, that's the word that I want, accepting. I couldn't find the right word. She's accepting of the fact that we come with thoughts, feelings, baggage, uh, things in our way, obstacles, and helping us to figure out how we cannot get rid of that, but acknowledge it, move through it, embrace it, and show up for our children. Love that about Evelyn Gould. She'll be with us here on Wednesday. Uh, and then during Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, uh, we have a very special gentleman who's going to be joining us, I believe via Skype on Wednesday, Scott Baddish, who is from uh, the Autism Society. 
This is the organization that recently put out a call to action suggesting that there be an autism summit, that all of the organizations get together and talk and put forth uh, perhaps a message to the world about what is important to us. We, we are a community that is large, we have numbers, we have the ability to be a huge voice if we are together. And while there is much to disagree about, and I think we can all agree on that, our kids are all different, what they need is different, and there's a lot to disagree about, there is even more to agree about. And if we were to combine all of our voices into one voice and come to some sort of an agreement about a message to be put forward so that we have some progress, we've, look, there's been a lot of progress, right? In the last five years, what we've learned about autism and what we've been able to do is absolutely amazing. Is it enough? No. And I think we all agree with that. And if we can come together in some substantive way, I imagine that there could be a huge leap, a, a world-changing, a game-changing leap. So we're going to be talking with Scott Badish about that on Wednesday and hopefully finding out what we can all do to make that happen, to make this Autism Summit happen and to make sure that everybody gets a voice. Because, uh, you know, as uh, a great parent has said on this show, he said, I I didn't find my voice until my child didn't have one. And we have a responsibility, all of us, whether our children are speaking or not, to be heard on behalf of our children, right? Uh, so we're going to be talking with Scott Badish about that on Wednesday. And uh, in, in the coming weeks, I'm really excited because Dr. Doreen Grampiche is going to be able to start joining us on a regular basis, uh, that we're going to have a special segment called Ask Dr. Doreen, when you will on a weekly basis have the ability to ask her questions in real time and you can send questions in ahead of time but that will be coming up and we'll give you more information about that there's a lot of exciting things about to happen here um, because you guys have asked for them so I uh, want to remind you lots of ways to get a hold of us I'm going to ask Emily to cycle through those pretty quickly because we're getting close to the end of the show write us tell us what you want to see what topics you want to talk about what experts you want to see we're uh going to be expanding a lot in terms of the kinds of things that we talk about because you guys have asked for them. So let us know what you need. Let us know what you like. Let us know what works for you. We want to be here for you uh, and help you on this journey to help whoever it is in your life that's on the autism spectrum to be the happiest and most productive and reach their fullest potential. Uh, we want that for ourselves as well, right? I want that. I want to be more effective, more efficient. Okay, so all of those things, uh, I just want to leave today's show with reminding you that if nobody else is saying it, I'm going to tell you, you're awesome and you're doing a great, great job and this isn't easy. And not everybody knows that, not everybody gets that, but you know that you know and you know that I know and there's a whole bunch of other people out there who know and we celebrate you and we celebrate your child. Um, and your journey through this because it's absolutely miraculous what you are doing. I will look forward to be uh, being with you. I, I will look forward to being with you. <laughs> I will look forward to talking with you again tomorrow at 9 a.m. Excuse me, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, until then, please give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye bye for now.